Thank you. Uh, well, good evening, everybody. I hope everybody had good holidays and a great new year. Um, so tonight we're going to start the new year out talking about uh, your, your winter backyard. Not much snow this year, but you still have plenty of opportunity to invite some colorful friends into your yard for dinner, drinks, and maybe a little shelter from the cold. There we go. Um, there are a whole lot of benefits to backyard bird feeding, and we're going to talk about those tonight as well as how we can feed in our backyards and maintain a backyard habitat in a way that's environmentally responsible. Um, backyard bird feeding attracts and supports populations of insect-eating birds that reduce the need for pesticides. And there's a, there's a big movement in a lot of the communities as people develop allergies, and especially with children and pets on the grounds, to move away from pesticides. Backyard citizen scientists collect data every year on different bird counts for the Cornell uh, uh, Laboratory of or Ornithology. And also it creates curb appeal for your home. Um, ask any real estate agent if someone's in your house and looking out and seeing nice birds back there. It just makes your home more appealing. So it contributes to property values when you have nature in the area. There's also many environmental benefits. And um, in fact, many people, myself included, consider it their responsibility to uh, create a habitat, both a social and environmental responsibility. And here's why. Um, if you look at this migratory map, and it's a real simple one, but it just gives you some basic migratory flyways. Um, in Michigan, we are, this isn't working too well there, but we're right in the crosshairs of two major flyways, the Atlantic Flyway and the Mississippi Flyway. So every year, hundreds of thousands, millions of birds move back and forth between the northern part of North America and the southern tip of South America as well as the Caribbean. They come in the spring to breed and they have to pass through Michigan. So number one, you'll have a tremendous opportunity to see birds that you normally wouldn't see, but number two, you're helping to support them. Frankly, as we continue to fragment our native habitats, our wildlife habitats, we create small islands that aren't capable of supporting large populations. And so you have these birds who have been passing through this area. They're literally genetically programmed to pass through this area every year to breed. Well, they travel quite a long ways, and they need areas to stop and rest and take nutrition in order to move on. So when you create a, a, a wildlife habitat in your backyard, you literally could be saving lives. And one of the reasons they pass through Michigan, it's not a coincidence that they come at a time when our wetlands are thawing. And so insect larva is hatching, insects that have been hibernating are coming out. And so they come at a time when there's a huge insect population brewing in, in the soup that is Michigan. Unfortunately, as we fragment the habitats and remove the native plants, we affect that insect population. So we need to do some supplemental feeding. And that's why I believe it's so important. But if you're going to feed birds, if you're going to create habitat in your yard, you have a responsibility to practice good stewardship. And that means to protect your birds from disease and overcrowding. It means to protect yourself, your family, your pets, and also your neighbors by practicing backyard bird feeding in a clean and responsible manner. It's a science. It isn't just putting food out. So you want to feed the right foods. You don't want to overfeed, it's not necessary. You want to use the right kinds of feeders. And you want to be sure and keep the area under your feeder clean with regular maintenance, especially if you're feeding seeds that have hulls. It's dirty down there, there's bird guano down there, and when you allow an area to develop the way this area has to collect all those seeds, you can attract rodents to your yard. And that's not something that you want to do. 
Don't put out food scraps or stale baked goods for birds, and it's not, it's not good nutrition for them, number one. It's not good for us, but we eat it. Um, but mainly, it's, it's going to attract unwanted guests. Now, this is just kind of a joke, because we know we're not going to have a bear here, but there are a lot of unwanted guests that you can invite to your yard by putting out the improper food and by feeding improperly. Birds have distinct food preferences. People say to me all the time, my birds don't care what I put out. I can put anything out. My birds will eat anything. No, they don't. Birds have distinct food preferences. Pet birds, for example, have an entirely different kind of diet than a wild bird does. It's not as high in fat because they're in a cage and they don't get the same kinds of exercise. There's food for soft-billed birds. There's food blends for hook-billed birds. And then you have game bird food, like chickens and turkeys and um, partridge and quail and uh, pheasant. These are birds that eat scratch. They eat grains as well as seeds and pellets. Well, we don't feed game birds in our immediate urban area, so you don't want to put game bird food out. What you want to put out is songbird food. And just because the bag says songbird food or wild bird food doesn't mean it's what you should be using. So you need to start reading the ingredients. You want to see seeds, real seeds, nuts, no grains, no pellets. And then, of course, songbirds also eat flower seeds, fruit, a little bit of vegetation, and a lot of insects. And that you're going to provide naturally in your habitat. Don't feed songbirds game blends. Game blends are the seed that you find in different stores, and you get a 50-pound bag for $7. And the, the reality is, is it's mostly corn, wheat, oats, groats, milo. Milo's bread, so birds won't eat it. Red millet, canary seed, buckwheat, and lately I'm seeing pellets. I don't know what kind of pellets, but pellets. Songbirds don't eat that. What they do is they throw it on the ground where it then collects under your feeder, and if you're not cleaning up daily, you're creating a nuisance situation. This is the food that songbirds prefer. Sunflower chips, that's hulled sunflower. It can be stripe or oilers, but it's hulled, so there's no mess. Peanut pieces, a lot of your woodpeckers, your nuthatch, cardinals, chickadees, titmouse, all like the peanuts. Dehulled millet, white millet, white proso millet, not red millet. You can also feed black oil sunflower in the shell, safflower seed, which does not come uh, pre-shelled, and thistle, or niger, as it's really called. Um, for the cleanest feeding, I would feed sunflower chips. It's a little more expensive investment initially, but you'll find that the birds go through it a lot slower because they're not throwing it all over. They're taking a chip, going away and eating it. So it's cleaner and it lasts longer. You can get blends of seeds also that have had the shells removed. Um, sunflower, safflower, they're going to get eaten. The problem is they may have some shells on the ground. And you know yourself when you crack nuts, especially like walnuts or Brazil nuts, you get a little bit of meat still in that shell. Well, that's what's going to happen on the ground, too. If you're feeding the right foods and you're feeding in the right quantities, the little bit of food that spills to the ground is going to be eaten by the ground-feeding birds, sparrows, doves, cardinals, long before the nocturnal mammals come out. So these are the foods that you want to give your songbirds. This is a typical game blend. So the only seeds in here, of all the seeds up there, the only seeds in there that songbirds eat are the black oil, sunflower, and the sunflower chips. Everything, and there's about 30 total of each of those in there. Everything else in there is a waste. So you are not saving money with those blends. They're great if you have a place up north and you want to throw your food on the ground or whatever, but in urban areas, we have to think urban, it's not a good seed to feed. And of course, the best way to store your seed is in metal cans that, uh, that you can seal with tight-fitting lids to help keep Mr. Squirrel and Mr. Raccoon out of it. I don't recommend storing bird seed in your house 
because all unprocessed grain has Indian meal moth eggs on it, even the rice that you bring in the house, oatmeal, whatever, and it hatches at 65 degrees. And that's those little white moths that you can get in your house, and they're really hard to get rid of. So I keep bird seed outside. Now we'll talk a little bit about feeders. You want to install your feeders for a successful experience for your birds, for yourself, and for your neighbors. Elevate all feeders at least four to five feet off the ground in a tree or on a pole. Install baffles on the poles to prevent rodents from climbing the poles. The baffles should be about five feet up. You can also use rodent-proof feeders, and I'll show you some in a minute, that are very effective. You can add trays to underneath your feeders, especially tube feeders, to control any seed from spilling to the ground. And also, once again, I stress, if you offer the right food in the right amounts, you shouldn't have any problems. Ground feeding is great for up north and great for out in the country or in the barnyard, but it has no place in urban bird feeding. And in fact, in almost every community around here, there's ordinances against it. And in some communities, it's actually a misdemeanor if you don't comply with their request to stop. So there's no reason to feed on the ground. It's not good for the birds, it's not good for your yard, and it's not good for your neighbors. You want to keep rodents off feeders, and there's all kinds of rodents. You know, people complain to me all the time about squirrels, they're eating all my food. Well, the, one of the ways that you can keep them off is to hang feeders from poles above a baffle, and the top of the baffle should be at five feet. So the feeder will be above that. That way they can't climb. And you need to have about a seven foot circumference around the feeder from anything that a squirrel or other rodent can jump from. Also, you can hang squirrel-proof feeders, and they work well in trees. Um, they're weight controlled, and um, you can actually set most of them based on the weight of bird or, or rodent that you want to keep off. Most birds weigh, their weights are in grams, and, and most rodents are in ounces. So anything four ounces or up, you're gonna keep off. Um, ground squirrels, it's hard to keep chipmunks off, but ground squirrels, um, any kind of squirrels, uh, the Norwegian rat weighs nine to 12 ounces, so you can keep all of those off of a feeder if need be. And so here's just two examples, a, a squirrel-proof feeder in a tree, a weight-based squirrel-proof feeder, and then also a uh, bird feeder setup showing you, you you've got baffles, you've, you, above and below you've got trays, so again you're feeding in a clean manner. And then there's, there's really five basic feeders, but we're not going to talk about the summer feeders tonight since it's not summer, but I will tell you about five basic winter feeders that you can put out, and this is a good amount. So the first kind are seed feeders, and they're going to attract your chickadee, goldfinch, nuthatch, titmouse, woodpeckers, um, <laughs> even wrens. Um, it's probably the most versatile feeder that you can have. Um, and so there's many styles. To the uh, left, we have um, just your basic tube feeder. Uh, it has a baffle and also weather guard on top, and then a tray on the bottom to prevent seed from spilling. This is a cylinder style feeder. These are kind of a new concept and it's, it's seed that's been compressed into a cylinder and it's kind of glued together with uh, a gel, an edible gel. And the cool thing about them is that the birds can't scatter the seed. And also because the bird has to work a little bit at it to get the seed off, they stay on the feeder a lot longer. And also, your food lasts a lot longer. So these have been kind of fun, and they have a, a lot of different styles. And then this at the bottom is a hopper-style feeder with a built-in tray to keep seed from spilling to the ground. Um, this one has uh, suet cages on the side as well, but this is, just happens to be one style. And here's some other styles of feeders, um, of seed feeders. The, uh, the feeder on the left is called a dinner bell. It, again, it kind of combines a tray with a baffle over the top. Uh, you can 
put loose seed in the bottom or you can actually put the cylinders, thread them on that rod. Again, it's kind of a nice clean feeding situation that also protects the birds. On the top right is a uh, hopper style squirrel proof feeder that's weight based. The weight based are the most effective. And below is another example of a basic hopper feeder, but this one's pole mounted instead of hanging. Has the tray on the bottom to catch seed. Window mount feeders are other types of seed feeders and they're pretty rodent resistant if they're on a window and about seven feet from anything they can jump from. And it's kind of nice because it brings it right up close and personal and after the birds get used to it, it'll be no problem. You'll have them right there feeding at your window. Um, the second type of bird feeder, although it's a seed feeder, it is a little different, is a Niger, or as people call it, a thistle feeder. What makes it different from a seed tube feeder is that instead of large holes to get the seed out of, they're very tiny slits in the ports for the tiny Niger seed. Um, we don't feed thistle in this country, and if you have um, the invasive Canadian thistle growing under your feeder, it's either coming from the wild or you're getting your seed from someone who's not selling you Niger and you're overpaying. Um, it really comes from the seed of an African yellow daisy um, that was from Nigeria. That's where the name Niger came from. And I cannot pronounce that Latin. Is there anybody here that can pronounce that? No? Um, Guizotia abyssinica? Okay then. Um, the name was actually, tra pardon? Just say it with authority. Yeah. <laughs> the name was actually trademarked as NYJER in 1998 by the wild bird feeding industry to clarify the pronunciation. But it got its name from its country of origin, which is Nigeria. It also comes from India and Indonesia. When it's brought into this country in the cargo ships, they're heat sterilized not to sterilize the Niger because it doesn't really grow here very well, but to sterilize any invasive weed seeds that might be in there, but inadvertently it sterilizes the Niger. There's always gonna be that little rogue seed that tries to bloom, but Niger is a very low growing plant with a small yellow flower. Um, and it's not at all related to thistle plants or seeds. It's good for attracting Goldfinch, I've had chickadee at my feeder, and sometimes I put a blend of fi real fine uh, sunflower chips in with my Niger, and I get woodpeckers, downy woodpeckers on my thistle feeder. So thistle feeders are good for small birds. Uh, number three is kind of a nutty thing. Um, peanut feeders are awesome for drawing woodpeckers and titmouse, um, chickadee, nuthatch, cardinals. Um, the feeders here, I just kind of showed, put the one on the left on just because I wanted to show the um, red bellied, but you can get these with, again, trays on the bottom to prevent spillage, and you, you can either do uh, or shelled peanuts. Jays like to take one of the whole peanuts at a time and, and take it off and feed it and, and come back. Um, whereas some of your smaller clinging birds will go more for the uh, peanut splits that have been hulled. Peanuts are good to feed in the winter. They're very high in protein and they're high in fat. And in the winter, when you're a bird living outdoors, you have to eat efficiently and you have to eat a lot of good fats in order to survive the cold. That's all you're doing is trying to survive the cold. If you only were to feed one thing in the winter, I would recommend that you feed thistle feed, or excuse me, suet. Suet is concentrated, it's fat, it's concentrated energy. And again, all our resident birds are trying to do in the winter is to survive the cold every day. And they have to eat a tremendous amount of calories in order to do that. Uh, the other thing that's good about suet is it's, it's fat and it's kind of a, a clump and so it doesn't really spill. So it's a clean way to feed. Never, ever, 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 ever hang out raw suet in urban areas. I have people tell me, oh, I just go to the butcher and get the suet, and the birds love it. And yep, they do. And that's fine for out in the country, but commercially prepared suet is virtually odorless, 
and it also has a lot of vitamins. It's better for the birds. Raw, unrendered suet emits a rancid meat smell that rats can smell up to a half mile away. You're just ringing the dinner bell. It has no place in urban feeding. In fact, it does, has the same effect as leftover grease on a barbecue grill does. It draws them in. So if you're going to do that, take it up north. If you're going to feed suet, you need to buy commercially prepared suet in order to protect your birds, yourself, and your neighbors. Mealworms are really a cool way to feed birds. Um, all birds eat insects, probably 80% of their diet, about 98% of what they feed their young is insects. And in the spring, it's especially good to feed mealworms because there, there isn't as many insects out yet. Um, and so that really helps when people call me and say, oh my God, Luann, it's winter and there's robins in my yard. What do I feed them? Mealworms, they, they love them. Uh, wrens love mealworms. And they're, they're a really clean way to feed. Um, rodents don't really bother with them much. And also, um, for, you can purchase them live, which is probably what the birds prefer. And they're in glass dishes or in dishes with sides so they can't get out. Um, for those of you who just can't handle live, you can get dried or you can even get canned food grade, human grade. Um, I suggest if you haven't tried mealworm feeding that you try it sometime. It's pretty addictive because of what you can bring in with it. And then the second part of your backyard habitat is to provide fresh, clean water year-round. Birds need fresh water year-round, but they especially need it during the winter to properly digest their food to stay warm to maintain their metabolism to stay warm, to conserve calories to stay warm, and to maintain clean feathers to stay warm. Birds have to wash their feathers year round. When they wash their feathers and get the dirt off, they preen and they oil them, and then they're able to fluff them and trap air in between the layers, and that's how they stay warm. You can't do that with dirty feathers. Also, you don't fly away from predators as well with dirty feathers. When birds are eating in the spring and summer, they're getting a lot of um, fruit and vegetation and insects in their diet, so they have a lot of liquid in their diets. But in the winter, their food is primarily dry seed. And you need water for metabolism. You need water, for, um, you need water in order for proper metabolism to stay warm and in order to conserve calories. You know, people will say to me, well, um, can't birds just eat the snow? Well, yeah, they can, so can you. But you have, you have to convert, you have to use, expend calories to convert snow to water. You have the ability to walk into a warm house where you don't have to worry about wasting calories to stay warm. But a bird is outdoors. So if they have to waste calories converting snow to water and then heating it up, they, they can't possibly eat enough calories to survive the night. So it, it really helps them to have open, fresh water. A chickadee with well-maintained feathers can maintain a 70-degree layer of air between their feathers and the outside at zero degrees. That's how important it is for them to stay clean. And again, anytime you're gonna take on a stewardship, you have responsibilities with that. When you have a bird bath, you have a responsibility to keep it clean and keep fresh water in it. You can clean it with a stiff brush. I like to use a mixture of white vinegar and water instead of uh, chlorine, but if you do use bleach, maybe about a tablespoon or a little less to a gallon of water, and then you have to rinse real well. Um, it's important to keep your bath clean because of the stuff that gets in there from them washing themselves, and um, it's also important to um, keep the water changed, particularly, we'll, we'll talk about summer one second, uh, so that no mosquito larvae can develop in there. Uh, the other thing is to offer birds shelter. 
You can offer natural shelter. I, it's probably kind of hard to see here, but that is a chickadee tucked in to some uh, to evergreen. And then we have a chickadee peeking out right here of a cavity in a tree. And in the uh, birds don't use nests so much in the winter. Nests are for raising babies. Cavities and, and areas to get away are shelter areas to get out of the cold. What happens, and this is how birds survive nights and how they survive super cold days, is they go into torpor. And that's regulated hypothermia is really what it is. They drop their uh, temperature 12 to 15 degrees below their normal temperature of 108. And so they're slowing down their body functions so only the most important organs, like the brain, are taken care of. It conserves 25% of its hourly metabolic expenditure when the temperature's at freezing. But that process and the whole process of surviving the night means that every day and every night, every night they burn up 10% of their body weight in calories or in you know, maintaining heat, and that has to be replaced. So every day they have to eat 10%. Again, that's why it's so important to have food out in the winter. A roosting box is a great way to provide a uh, space for birds to shelter from the winter. The roosting box on the left, does anybody know why the hole is at the bottom? Right. In a house, the hole's at the top because the nest is down at the bottom. In a roosting box, the hole's at the bottom because heat rises. And if I were to open that roosting box up and show you, what you would see is several pegs in there and you would see many different kinds of birds flocking together and squishing together to stay warm and maintain heat. And uh, a roosting box is really a great thing to have, and a lot of them you can flip them over in the summer and use them as nesting boxes. And like even as in a nesting box, you would want to mount it so that the hole is facing south or southeast because your bad weather comes from the north and the west. And then these on the right are European nesting pockets, and you can tuck those in trees or hang them from branches or tuck them in a building. And again, it's a little place for a bird to go in and just get out of the cold and go into torpor and maintain that body heat. So in review, if you want to have a backyard habitat and you want to color your, your backyard with beautiful birds all winter, Number one, offer the right food for the right birds. Practice good housekeeping. Keep rodents off feeders. You won't waste as much food, and it, the, you'll get better birds on your feeder. Offer fresh open water year-round. During the winter, you can heat that water by either purchasing a heated bath or there are heaters that will go into uh, other baths. They, they're very energy efficient. They kick on at a freezing, and they take the water level or temperature up to around 50 degrees, and then they go off. So they're very efficient to run. And provide shelter and nesting areas in your habitat, but most of all, enjoy your birds. Thank you. Any questions? Sparrows are tough because, for one thing, if you have a lot of bushes in your yard, like arborvitae or boxwood, that's where they live. Um, keeping the ground clean and sometimes feeding single seeds like black oil sunflower. I have people tell me that they don't like black oil sunflower. Mind you. I have people tell me they don't like safflower. I can show you people who they do. But the main thing I would say is to keep it clean and to avoid blends that have millets or anything like that. What kind of feeder do you have? Squirrel buster, okay, yeah. The regular. Oh, they're awesome feeders. They're the best feaders out there. 
You know, it's so hard, and it's weird because in Europe, there's really a crisis going on in England because they're losing their house sparrow population. <laughs> I got an idea. <laughs> Want to help me? <laughs> um, you know, they live where humans live, and um, it, you rarely, but they can take over. They can take over, and they're messy. That being said, I had a pet sparrow for four years, and I just loved her. She was a riot. But yeah. a whole bunch of them is, it is. It's, it's hard in the city. I mean, it doesn't seem, the other birds don't seem to be affected by them. Right. They, you know, the blue jays just looked at them like, get out of here. Yeah. You know? So, um, yeah. But, yeah, it's hard. It just, okay. it is. Did you have a question? Yeah. What about a bubbler? Uh, you, the water moving, I sure, there's a couple different options. Um, you can do like a, a dripper or mister. And then there's also a product called a water wiggler, which is battery operated. Uh, and with a good battery, it will last all season and it kind of stirs the water. So it, um, birds are highly attracted to moving water or the sound of moving water. And also it breaks the surface tension of the water which keeps the mosquito, well, it doesn't so much keep it from freezing if it's real cold in our climate, uh, but it does keep mosquitoes from being able to mature, mosquito larvae. Um, in this winter, I, I actually have a bubbler in my pond that's working real well, because we haven't really had the kind of cold, but uh, really in the winter, you gotta use a heater. Any other questions? You know what, you're always gonna get a little bit, number one. There's, there's going to be a tiny bit, and that's okay, because it will get eaten quickly. But if you have a tray, the doves will get up on the tray. Mm -hmm. Will juncos get up the tray too? Can they ever get up on anything? I, I don't really see juncos up there, but again, that's why if you feed hulled, no mess blends, uh, or, or um, I just am feeding sunflower chips right now, the tiny bit that goes on the ground will get cleaned up, and that's how it's supposed to work. It's when you have the wrong blends and there's a bunch of it on the ground that it's a problem. And I'm actually having those hunter feeders. Have you? Yeah. Uh, on the yeah. squirrel buster? Uh, no, actually my thistle feeder. And really? I mean, they're capable of doing yeah. it. It's surprising. I guess if that's a, the only way they can get to it. Cool. Because usually you can't. Bring those in. I'd like to see those. Okay. Thanks. Did you have a question? Yeah. Um, well, I would clean my feeders at least once a month. Um, kind of keep an eye on I mean, if they're getting a little dirty. Um, you can use a solution. I'd probably use a, a solution of um, bleach and water maybe a tablespoon to a gallon of water and scrub it real good with a brush. There's also a really good product called um, Scoot that you can soak it in and it's an enzyme cleaner. Um, and then rinse it really, really well and dry it really well so you won't get any mold. And you wanna wash the outside too because uh, especially in the spring, you don't wanna spread uh, the possibility of finch conjunctivitis. Anybody else? A squirrel, your basic squirrel can jump straight up five feet. Now there's always going to be that, you know, um, Olympic squirrel that can go six or seven. But basically, if you put a baffle with the top of it at five feet, you should be good. Now, he can jump seven feet across and ten feet down. Then you just get that, so you have to have a pole. The problem with most single piece shepherd poles is they're not tall enough, but there are poles available that come in pieces, components, so you can build it up to have the top of that baffle high enough. Or do a squirrel poof feeder. Yeah, I was going to Prince Hardware tomorrow because I've got that rack inside a pole. Okay. I'm going to put a wooden dowel in there to raise it up higher. Okay. So you're saying five feet. You want the top of the baffle at five feet. 
You know, if you do put anything like that on your feeder, don't use any petroleum-based no, products. No, I, mean, it's, I, just wanted, I just want to do it because I have dogs, and I, we have a lot of dogs, and I just don't. Right. Well, you're welcome to stop in and see us, and we can show you solutions, and you know, you, we'll, we'll do what we can to help you. Any other questions? Yes. This is kind of an anti-question. Okay. <laughs> Well, you, you know, you can't put out fruits and vegetables and berries and nuts in a garden environment and expect wildlife not to come. So I would say cement the whole backyard. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really, you can't, you can't put food sources or water sources out and not attract them. It, it's, you know, it's what it is. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. I had one of those Olympic squirrels in my yard that climbed six feet up to the kitchen window and was eating his way to the screen. What was it climbing up? The, the, it climbed up from the ground. But on, and what, what kind of siding do we have? Uh, uh, brick. Oh, so it climbed up brick. Oh, it jumped up. Okay. And it was eating a hole in my screen. And if I hadn't had something sitting on the windowsill, it would have been in the house. Because I'd heard something fall. Do you feed the squirrel? No. Nope. Huh. I haven't seen him this summer, but he was last summer and he ate a big hole. Holy cow. I know. And I don't have a question. And you don't feed him? or I mean, I have heard of people who feed squirrels and then the squirrel gets. Yeah, real too friendly. Yeah. Wow. That's scary. Was it a red squirrel? Any other questions? We good? Well, thanks for having me. And uh, like I said, enjoy your birds in your yard. We got a lot of great species around here, and um, this is a great time to, to see a lot of them. Yes. The goldfinch. She has a goldfinch that comes to her feeder. She's got a great setup. I love it. That's why I'm doing it in the front yard. And my neighbors don't like it. Well, that's okay. I'll clean it up in the springtime. Um, but a goldfinch, it's white, and it just has a little bit of gold on top of its head. And it's white. I mean, that c it can happen. It ha there's. I know there's a cardinal. cardinal um, in the area that's albino, the person that told me won't tell me where it is, um, and and I understand why. Yeah, I'd like to see that. What kind of seed are you feeding in your front yard? Thistle. Thistle. Okay. 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 So you'll just you'll just want to keep that area clean. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, you'll want to just keep it clean under there. <laughs> Can I help anyone else or y'all? Y'all good? All right. Well, thank you.